Hey folks, this is Vicki Connor. And I'm Jamie Hale. This spring marks the return of a lot of beautiful attractions here in the Pacific Northwest, but one of the things we're most excited about is the return of Circles in the Sand on the Southern Oregon coast, which starts back up on April 21st this year. So to mark the occasion, we're bringing back one of our all-time favorite episodes, which first aired two years ago when we spoke to Denny Dyke, the man behind the beautiful sand labyrinths. We'll be back with a new episode next week, but in the meantime, we hope you enjoy this talk with Denny about his incredible circles in the sand. We'll see you next time. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Peak Northwest, an outdoors and travel podcast by The Oregonian and Oregon Live, dedicated to the adventure and exploration of our beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm Jamie Hale. And I'm Jim Ryan, and together we take you to some of the most beautiful and interesting destinations in our region, discussing where to go, what to do, and places to see. And today we are going down to the southern Oregon coast town of Bandon, where a local artist and a team of volunteers are doing something that's kind of incredible. That's right, Jim. They call it Circles in the Sand, uh, a series of events where those volunteers gather together to create beautiful labyrinths on the beach during low tide. So each event draws upwards of about 400 people these days, um, and each person who shows up is invited to walk the labyrinth after it's finished. And Jim, I've been to a couple of Circles in the Sand events before, and I have to say they're really, really cool experiences. Yeah, it sounds like it, Jamie. You know, I I haven't been down there uh, myself, but I've seen some of your photos and they look very cool indeed. And here on the show today, we have the man behind the labyrinths themselves, artist and spiritual practitioner, Denny Dyke. Denny, thanks so much for joining us. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I'm excited to dive into this, Denny. But before we get too far, you know, we have been calling these labyrinths. Uh, You call your creations dream fields. Uh, Can you describe what you're doing and and, uh, give us a visual here of, of what these look like? Okay. Uh, yeah, they, they are labyrinths. Uh, a labyrinth is simply a path that is continuous with no dead ends and no wrong turns. Uh, I describe mine as ring, green fields because there's multiple labyrinths inside of it, and they're just all interconnected. So uh, anyway, what I do is uh, I lay out the path work and, and circles uh, in between. And then my the rest of my team will come in and put sand art uh, inside those circles. Uh, we have individual themes. Uh, we do uh, ocean theme. We do a zen theme. We do nature. And that just keeps the artwork consistent. And uh, a typical piece covers, uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective, probably an acre and a half uh, wow. approximately of sand. And then when we get done, it looks like a giant paint by number. And then we invite 12 volunteers to come in and uh, help us finish grooming it up. And all they do is like rake in between in the void areas. And then uh, when we're done, I give a short opening talk explaining that uh, Circles in Sand is all about love. And uh, that's our intention. And uh, then we invite everybody to take a walk. And uh, most walks are right now about three eighths of a mile. So you got about 15 minutes to go out and just enjoy a nice peaceful walk. Nothing else to do but listen to the ocean and, uh, you know, spend a little time with yourself. We don't do enough of that. They're such beautiful creations. And looking at them from above, you see these sort of these swirls, these spirals, these swooping shapes um, creating the, uh, the paths of the labyrinth. And once you're inside of it, it, you know, it's just like any labyrinth experience, just walking through, winding across the paths. It's very beautiful and very meditative. And, you know, I feel like a lot of people see these um, and think back to being kids and, you know, drawing things on the beach. And this is kind of like the, you know, the the much more sophisticated version of doing that. But Denny, I'm curious, you know, how, how did you get started doing these labyrinths in the first place? Well, I, I, I've i been involved with Labyrinth since 2002. Uh, I've had a couple canvases during my career and uh, had indoor events. And then I moved up to Oregon in 2007. 
did a lot of hiking and fishing and that sort of thing for several years. And uh, then I started drawing individual labyrinths on the coast j just for my own walking and meditation use. I, in fact, I'd draw them right down at the tide line, walk them, and, and stand there and watch the ocean retrieve it. So mm. uh, that's kind of how it started back in about 2011. 2014, I came up with the basic pattern that I'm using now. Uh, with multiple uh, spirals and labyrinths uh, all interconnected. And uh, then 2015, I uh, had the opportunity to go ahead and create it as, uh, quote, a business. And so I put out a full-time schedule uh, for the first time, and I continue to do that. This summer, uh, we've got 32 draw days uh, between May and August. So, um, you know, it's really an honor to be able to do what I do. Yeah, absolutely. So where do these designs come from? You know, do you do you plan these out in advance or do you figure it all out once you get there? I figure it out as I'm doing it. Uh, I, I stand up on uh, above it uh, first on the, you know, the wayside mm -hmm. and figure out where I can draw it. The sand moves around, the wet spots move around. Uh, and then you go down on the sand and I put in my dedication circles, which is just a real large circle with our logo in the middle uh, that people are invited to sign uh, either for themselves or uh, somebody they want to walk the labyrinth for. Uh, and then I put in my entrance and exit, which are always right next to each other. And then I just walk out in the middle of the sand and start drawing spirals and go over someplace else and draw another one and then connect them all together, basically. And what tools are you using to do this? I, I, I guess, give me a visual. <laughs> it, it, it's really just a rake. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I customized it just a little bit, uh, but it's just uh, uh, a normal rake. It's about eight inches wide. And uh, I just drag it and it lifts the sand up really easily. Uh, and uh, it's really easy to control. Uh, and in most of the pieces, you never see my actual rake marks except in the middle of a spiral because when they groom it, we, we, we cover the line that I drew so that it's one consistent ah, uh, got uh, it. matte look. Um, and then uh, my artists use uh, a, a stick we created which has got a chopstick on one end for the detail work and a little blade, wooded blade on the other end. And they use a small rake, and how they do what I do, we'd have to ask them one day. Because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do the detail work that they do. They, they, they really do a marvelous job and really adds to the experience. I love the creativity there, you know, the chopstick, making your own tools um, for that purpose. That That's, I think, just a stroke of genius. And so all of these these draws, to, to be clear for folks um, who aren't aware, that these all take place at um, Face Rock State Scenic Viewpoint, which is down in Bandon. It's a, a beautiful little stretch of beach with a, a nice big cliffside viewpoint over top of it and some of these really large and and really interesting looking sea stacks and rocks situated around the beach. So Denny, what, what is it about that spot? And why is it that that became sort of your, your go-to spot to draw these, these labyrinths? Well, basically it became the go-to spot by accident. I, I was drawn uh, down up north from there a little bit and uh, different seasons, the sand moves around and it's wetter or drier. Uh, and it got so bad I couldn't even draw up there. So I just went south, found face rock. It's nice because during the different parts of the season, I can draw on the north side or the south side, uh, just depending on where the sand's at. So I've got a lot more variables. Uh, we've got better parking access up at the state park. Uh, they have restroom facilities. Um, the one thing that we hurdle that we do have right now is trying to control all the parking because uh, obviously mm -hmm. I bring a, a lot more into the neighborhood. Uh, we're working with the city and uh, some other folks on uh, at least by next season have a shuttle system set up or something along that line so we can alleviate some of that um but uh no it's uh, i've got one of the most beautiful offices in the world <laughs> <laughs> i would say so yeah. uh no complaints there well denny i mean you mentioned just a little bit about um some of the wind um some of the things you've had to contend with but i mean how how do you contend with those conditions on the beach i mean the tide comes up it gets windy you know all those different factors that play into it 
Yeah, uh, I, I can count on the tides, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, we know when that's going to happen. Uh, we also know we're on the coast in Oregon, so we're not never really sure what the weather's going to do. Uh, and keep in mind, like on, a, on an 8 o'clock walk draw, that means we're on the sand before 6. Oh, wow. Okay. And so it takes us a couple hours to finish it up to get ready. And uh, the weather can change from the time we get there to the time we start to two, three hours later when the tide starts coming in, the sun's come out, the winds come up, or or whatever. Uh, the wind is probably the hardest thing to deal with, uh, but there's not much you can do about it. Uh, so uh, th- this week was a real challenge. Every day the sand moved around quite a bit, and uh, it was a challenge to be able to find enough uh, workable space that was out of the uh, 18-mile-an-hour wind that was blowing at the time. Yeah, uh, you're working in a wild environment, you know, uh, it's not a, a, a typical studio, typical workspace to say the least. So, no, it's not. um, so you've mentioned, you know, before that, that circles in the sand, it, it's more than just kind of a, a neat thing to look at, right? It's a attempt to offer some real healing and meditative experience to people who show up. Can, can you explain how that works a little bit? Yeah. And that's the intention behind everything that circles in the sand does. And, and my intention behind it all is just to create, first of all, uh, give folks an opportunity to walk a labyrinth that they never have. Uh, and, uh, that's always good, but the meditative aspect of any labyrinth, uh, and it seems accentuated a little bit down on what I do on the sand, is that for a while you don't have anything else to be concerned with, okay? You're just following the path uh, down where we're at. You can listen to the ocean and the breeze and uh, look at the artwork and the sea stacks and listen to the birds and just enjoy uh a, a nice walk for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, one of the most common comments I, I have from most people is they've never seen so many people smiling at the same time. <laughs> you know, it just does something. It just, mm-hmm. there's nothing to be upset about. You know, uh, the respect that everybody gives the work is phenomenal. But our intention um, is to share as much love as we can. Our mantra is share love, show love, and be love. And, um, we, we just wrap that into everything we do. And, and once you start thinking along those aspects, that, that energy level just grows and all of our groomers, uh, sit out there and, uh, of course they're a little nervous when they first start, but once they get into it, it's like a Zen garden. Everybody's just, they start smiling or we had one lady listen to, I don't know what she was listening to on her earbuds, but she was having a great time. You know, and uh, but all that loving energy is out there. And then, of course, we set the tone uh, by explaining, you know, everything is done by intention. You know, we're just not always aware of what our intention is. So if we're going to set attention like I do every day, then I'm going to spread as much love, joy, peace, harmony as I possibly can, because that's the energy that will reflect back into my life. And uh, if we can just get people starting to think along those lines a little bit more, knowing that we're all interconnected, knowing that we're all one, uh, and and life is meant to be enjoyed. Uh, we just went through a year of uh, no hugs and, and that sort of thing. And I almost had to go to therapy. You know, uh, we need people. We need that contact. And uh, so we're back on the sand we're we're spreading love the one thing i do this year that's a little different is i request everybody that walks with us to use the word love at least 15 times Hmm. okay and if it's got an i in front of it a u behind it no bonus points but i love you always (laughs) okay and if they lose count during the day i tell them they gotta start over you know so if we can just uh get the feeling that they have after they're walking and they and they've just been saturated with all this loving energy, uh, they take that back into their lives. Uh, they discuss their experiences, uh, whatever that happened to be, and uh, it's all positive. And uh, nowadays, uh, that's all you can do is bring as much positive energy into the world as you can. 
Oh, I, I love that, Denny. That's really good. And I'm going to count that as one for me for the day right now. There you go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, there's there's something, too. You know, when I was um, down there last time, Denny, talking to you about this, um, you mentioned there's something, too, about about the beach itself. People are kind of primed to be in that more open space. And something about that environment that allows people to maybe um, enter that kind of um, headspace maybe a little bit more easily. Oh, absolutely. I uh, Years ago, I had some, uh, we, we have a lot of beach walkers, you know, locals that are down there all the time. And uh, this one lady, she had to be in her mid 80s. And she, she'd just stand back and watch, you know, that sort of thing. And she came up one day and she says, how do you do it? You know, everybody settles down and, and, you know, you don't see that anyplace else. And just like you were saying, I says, well, they're halfway there when they get there, you know. Uh, when they get out of that car or leave whatever they're staying and come down to the beach, they're in a different environment. You know, they don't have to worry about all this other stuff, you know. Uh, and then once we get them on the path, uh, even with their kids and everything else, they soon realize the kids are staying on the path. They know exactly where, they at, where they're at and they don't have to worry about them. You know, except for the ones that are carrying two kids and pushing a stroller. <laughs> you know? They got a little bit more to keep track of. Oh, yeah. And uh, it, at least hopefully it brings them a little quiet time for a little while, you know. Uh, but no, it's uh, to, to, to share love the way we do. Uh, and uh, my entire team, we, we just embrace that. You know, that that's our goal. And everybody says, well, gee, you know, we'd really appreciate it. Well, they got to spend about an hour with us, maybe. Uh, we get to do this for six hours a day. Okay. And uh, I'm going through a little bit of withdrawal today after four days of six-hour treatment. Uh, but uh, I'll make it till the next draw. Awesome. Well, Denny, so what does the remaining um, 2021 season look like for you? I mean, for people who maybe want to go down there and see circles in the sand for themselves, they only have um, a few more opportunities now. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we've only got two draws in August, a three day that starts on August 10th. And uh, the final one's only a two day on August 24th. And then we do make one travel trip in October up to Florence. Uh, at in front of Driftwood Shores, uh, this will be our fourth year going up there for the folks that uh, you know want a little shorter drive to come over and see us. Well, love to hear it, Denny. Uh, this sounds like a very, uh, very cool thing for folks who have not gone to witness it and experience it for themselves. They should check it out. But before we let you go, I have one more question. What happens to these, uh, you know, these draws kind of once you are no longer maintaining them? Do they kind of slowly drift away or how, how long do these tend to last? Oh, it's, uh, I, I call it when, when it gets bit, when the, when the waves come in close enough to at least touch the outer perimeter. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it can take up to two and a half hours, three hours. Mm -hmm. uh, to to remove the whole thing, and it normally comes in uh, a, a series of waves will come in, take about traditionally you know fifteen twenty feet of it, and then it recedes back quite a ways, you know, and then the next mm -hmm. series comes in, and it'll it'll just slowly uh, take the whole thing, and a lot of times there's two high tides a day, um, and the first high tide after I draw is is a little bit lower than the second one, and a lot of times it won't even take all of the labyrinth out the second high tide will so it's clean when i get there the ocean's nice about cleaning my mess up for me <laughs> you know and i get a fresh canvas every day to start with but it is kind of bizarre to go down there um and, and see about 20 feet uh you know 100 yards long of this wavy line and stuff that doesn't make sense hmm. you know but uh no it's uh it takes a long time for it to actually go away completely, you know, and people seem to walk it until, well, until there's not much left. Well, I, I, I love that. Well, Denny, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, come down and see me on the sand. I'll put you to work. <laughs> I like the Perfect. sound of that. Perfect. <laughs> Have a good rest of your day, Denny. I promise you guys take care. We'll see you on the sand. Perfect. Thanks Bye. a lot, Denny. 
that was a lot of fun. I mean, I've seen the photos, right, uh, a number of times, uh, seen the photos of this, and it is extremely captivating just to view, uh, you know, from the comfort of wherever I'm on my computer. But uh, to get uh, Denny's description of, you know, how and why he does this was was pretty neat. Yeah. You know, and Jim, to, to go and walk one of these labyrinths is such a different experience than just seeing a picture of one. So I, I would recommend anyone who can get down to the abandoned area, you got to check it out. Exactly, folks. So uh, we are actually going to talk a little bit more about some of the other things to do while you're down abandoned. But first, we're going to take a short break. All right, folks, we are back here talking about, you know, some more things to do in Bandon should you take a trip down in that direction. And, you know, Jamie, thankfully, there is plenty, plenty, plenty to see and do in the area other than, of course, checking out Circles in the Sand. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a long drive to get down to Bandon for those of us in the Portland area. Um, it's not, you know, just out to the coast. It's down there quite a ways. So, you know, it's nice to spend a couple of nights there if you're going to go down there at least. Um, and of course, touring up and down the southern coast is beautiful. But in Bandon itself, Jim, I love this little town and there's just so much to do just right there. Yeah, I mean, like you said, we have circles in the sand. We've got beautiful lighthouse. We've got, of course, Bandon Dunes Golf Resort, which is uh -huh. a really renowned place. Yeah, I don't I don't golf. I'm not good enough at it. But if I did, <laughs> if I was good enough to play at a fancy golf course, I would 100 percent play at Bandon Dunes. That's such a cool spot. S some of my relatives, they regularly go out there as kind of like a big I think they go annually. I might be speaking out of turn here, but kind of like a big hurrah of sorts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if, if you say you're among a party of golfers anywhere in the country and you say Bandon Dunes, that's probably going to mean something to them. Right? Probably, probably for for the rest of us, the casual tourists. I, you know, Jim, what I love to do um, is to just hang out in that kind of downtown Bandon area, kind of that little old town um, where you've got lots of shops and restaurants and cafes and bakeries. There's a chocolate shop. Um, you can go get cranberry flavored everything because the cranberry bogs mm -hmm. nearby um, and there's this great little trio of like seafood shacks that are right there on the water um, you know just across the way from the lighthouse um, there's like a, a abandoned bait shop um, there's cra the crab shack um, and there's a fish and chip spot they're all like right next to each other so you can kind of go there and check out whichever one calls to your heart more um, or whichever one uh, you know or try all three Honestly, get yourself some crab, get yourself some fish, um, then get yourself some bait and go fish for more fish. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can you can really have it all right there. Um, that's one of my favorite little spots there to eat in downtown Bandon. And just down the street is, is this really cool spot called the Washed Ashore Gallery. And it's a gallery of these like sculptures made out of um, trash that has been collected from the ocean. Uh, and these are like these huge sculptures, some of them um, really, really well done. So um, it's, you know, obviously a really cool um, uh, activity they're doing, making, you know, art out of trash they're saving from the environment. Um, but the art they make there is also just really cool to see on its own. And you may see some of the sculptures around Bandon as well. Um, some of these trash uh, marine life sculptures. That's really, really beautiful and super cool. Extremely fun. And Jamie, uh, it's all not to mention, of course, the beautiful beaches and outdoor activities uh, around Bandon. You know, we have Coquille Point, uh, kind mm -hmm. of a, a beautiful headland just south of the Coquille River. Uh, the Bandon State Natural Area, you know, a, a great spot for fishing. I, I know, Jamie, you've uh, seen some horseback riding and such down there, um, you know. Bullard's Beach State Park, a, a pretty big state park stretching from the Coquille River north to Bandon Dunes, the golf resort we referenced. So uh, moral of the story is uh, plenty to occupy you for a good long weekend, if you will. Yep. And Jim, you're going to want to go down to the Face Rock Creamery and get yourself some Ooh. ice cream <laughs> and some cheese <laughs> and all of those dairy products that I'm sure you would uh, totally be down for. 
uh, you know me well, Jamie. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the the ice cream treat is, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like it's almost mandatory uh, on a trip <laughs> like that, right? If, if you're spending a, a long weekend somewhere and you're not sampling uh, the local ice cream shop, uh, what are you even doing? That's right. Man? That's right. Uh, what are you even doing? You know, I, I could I could uh, I could stand by that motto a hundred percent. So, Jamie, lots of good things to do. And of course, uh, lots of goodness uh, all wrapped up in the circles in the sand. Folks can go check those out in Southern Oregon, of course, uh, at Bandon. Before we go, I should reference, uh, you can find more about uh, Denny's installations, for lack of a more apt way to put it, at sandypathbandon.com. And folks, until next time here on the show, you can watch our videos on the Oregonians YouTube channel. Follow us on Instagram at Peak Northwest and view all of our travel and outdoors coverage on OregonLive.com slash travel. Please leave us a rating or review if you enjoy the show. And if you want to support this podcast and our local journalism, please consider a subscription to Oregon Live. You can find details, of course, at OregonLive.com slash pod support. This episode of the show was produced by me, Jim Ryan, alongside Jamie Hale and Andrew Thien. Stay safe and happy travels, everyone. Until next time, we leave you with this 10 seconds of Zen.